All right. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing what the Word of God will do in our lives when we just take it and we will apply it. It changes everything. We're in the series, and this is the seventh week of the story of my life. This is about the life story of Joseph and how that story becomes our story. The reason why that I wanted to go into this series in the beginning of the year is for us to understand that, that what I desire is I want to go to a higher level in 2014. I don't want to stay where I was in 2013. I want to move in every area of my life. I want to move up. And, and I want that for you. I want this series to change everything about your life. Because in Joseph's life, Joseph had to pass eight tests to elevate him and to move him to the position of where God wanted him to be, his divine destiny. And you're not going to reach your divine destiny if you do not pass these eight tests that he went through and that we must go through as well. And so as we've gone through these, it's been very fascinating because the first test that Joseph went through and that we go through is the pride test. Joseph, at the age of 17, he failed this test, he failed it miserably, and he had to take it over again. We've also talked about the pit test, the purity test, the prison test, the power test. Last week was the prosperity test. And today I want to talk about the pardon test. Now, you will notice that as we've talked about these tests, that there may be one that has put you on edge, one that you did not like, maybe one that almost seemed to offend you, uh, one that seemed to prick you and, and, and made you feel uncomfortable. That probably is a sign that that's the test that you're not doing very well in. And I want to remind you of this, that if there is a test that you do not pass and that you're not obedient in, it is going to stop you dead in your tracks and you're not going to move toward your God-given destiny, the reason and the purpose that you were created. You cannot reach that destiny until you pass all eight of these tests. In the booklets that we have passed out to you, one of the things that I've asked you to do, take notes. Let this be a booklet that you can go back to many, many times. Write personal things in this booklet. But at the end of every message, you've got to determine and write in this book, you are either passing or you are failing. And it's important for us to know where we are. When we fail a test, it doesn't shatter us. It just under, we just understand that this is an area that I need to focus in on and that I need to correct in my life, and it will help us tremendously. The pardon test. Let me ask you, have you ever been hurt by someone? Have you ever been offended? Seems like we live in a world of where everybody is offended. We live in a very sensitive society. Everybody's wounded. Everybody's offended. Everybody is picking on me. We've created that in our society. But have you ever really been offended by someone? Someone done you so wrong that it affects your life and it affects your future. And when this happens, how do you deal with it? And what do you do? And we have this amazing example of Joseph of how that he operated in forgiveness. And it's a level in which we need to set as a pattern in our own lives. Now, I speak spent much time in a message just a couple of months ago on forgiveness. Went into much detail in that message. And I want to go in a little bit of a different direction today as I follow the story of Joseph. Now, Joseph was, was great in so many areas of his life. He wasn't great just because he was able to interpret dreams. He wasn't great because he was able to rise out of a place of prison all the way to the second in command of all of Egypt. That's not why he was great. Joseph wasn't great just merely because he saved all of Egypt from starvation. But you find that he was great because he was heroic when it came to the power of forgiving. I want to go back and rewind a little bit as we begin to wrap up this series Go all the way back to where Joseph is 17 years of age. And his father gives him the coat of many colors. And it's an expensive coat. And when the coat is given to the youngest son, all the older brothers are watching this. And the father's 
favoritism begins to leak out. And they know that, that he loves Joseph more than all of them. The coat that was given to him was hand-tailored. It was custom-made. It was made from Neiman Marcus. It was very, very expensive. And he loved wearing the coats. And as he wore the coats, it was a constant reminder to all the other brothers that he loves him in a way that he will never love us. And they begin to hate Joseph, their younger brother. One commentary writing about this put it this way. This was an open, visible, in-your-face expression of raw favoritism. Why Jacob the father did this, no one really knows, but it created great havoc in their family. And the brothers continued to hate him more and more. Now, being young and being 17, God had also given him dreams of how one day that he would be in a great position, and even his own family and brothers would bow down to him. God did not give him that dream to share, but God gave him that dream to show his divine destiny and where he was headed, and that greatness was in front of him. But he abused that. And he used it as power in his own life as a 17-year-old. And he would go to his brothers, and he did it more than once, and he would say to them, listen to the dream that God has given to me, that one day all of you older brothers will bow down to me. And it fueled the fire of hatred and jealousy. And the Bible goes on, and it keeps repeating this, and they hated him more and more and more until it was uncontainable. One day, the brothers were out on the field tending to their father's flocks. They look up and they see someone coming. And it says, and he comes from a far distance. While he is still so far away, they see who it is. It's their younger brother. And they know why that he's coming, that dad has sent him out to assess the job that we're doing. And they all knew that Joseph would go back as a tattletale and tell everything that they were doing wrong. And they see him from a long distance away, and they start plotting his murder. That we're going to kill him when he arrives. Now let me ask you a question. While he was still so far away, how did they recognize and know that it was Joseph who was coming? Because of his coat that was glistening in the sun. And it just was an irritation to them. And as he is coming, they make this statement. They say, oh look, here comes the dreamer. Now they didn't use his name, here comes our brother Joseph, but here comes that dreamer. You know, it's human tendency that when we're jealous of someone and when we hate someone so bad that that we don't even want to use their name, that we don't even want to really identify them as a person. Have you ever noticed how we do that? We don't don't want to call them by name. But we'll say something like this, that, that, oh, here he comes, not using his name. Or here comes the village idiot. Or we'll say something like, oh, here comes Mr. It, who really thinks he is something. But we'll avoid using their names, and they would not use his name. And when he arrived that day, they stripped him of his coats, and they threw him into a pit, which was a dry well. And what they desired to do was to leave him in that pit, let him starve to death, and let him rot and die, and they would walk away and leave him there. And that's what they had planned. But the oldest brother wasn't quite there, wasn't quite sure that he wanted to be a part of that premeditated murder. And there was a caravan that is coming by, and they wave the caravan down, and they, the, the riders of this caravan come by on camels, They pull Joseph out of the pit, and they sell him as a slave. And those brothers stand there that day, and they watch Joseph be bound with rope and led away 
like an animal. And the caravan disappears over the hill. They then take that robe that they stripped off of his back. They tore it into shreds, dipped it in goat's blood, and they took it back to dad. They walk in and they give it to Jacob and they said, this is what we found in the field. And Jacob looks at it and he assumes that the son in which he loves so dearly has been killed by wild animals and he grieves and he mourns and he sobs and Jacob never got over it. Joseph, I want to talk the next few moments about how do you forgive at that level. Number one, the first thing that you'll see in your book, the word release. Release. You know, the action of these brothers could not have been more cruel. I want to try to get all of us into the, into the story, and I want us to understand what was really going on there, because they sold their brother into slavery, knowing that it was the harshest life that anyone could ever live. That's what they were selling him into. When they took him away, they realized that Joseph, this young boy, would never be cared by for, any, cared by for anybody ever again, and that he would be under the master's whip the rest of his life, and that animals would be treated better than him. And one day when he had grown in age and he was no longer strong and useful, that they would execute him as a slave and throw his lifeless body away like a piece of trash. That's what they knew they were selling him into. And if you were Joseph, being led away, being sold by your own brothers, how would you feel? How would you deal with that? It's far more than just someone talking bad about you. It's far more than just someone who has harsh words for you. But it's somebody that that has so damaged you that it's damaged you and your future. And when someone hates you and hurts you at that level, how do you deal with it? Now, the word forgiveness means release. There's that word again. To forgive is to pardon. It is to be acquitted. And here's the pardon test in which we are taking today that if you cannot forgive, then you will not advance in life. That whatever level someone has wounded you, hurt you, you cannot justify, but you don't know what they have done. Because if you cannot forgive, you cannot advance. Unforgiveness is the opposite of God's nature. We don't operate as believers opposite of God, but we follow God. Unforgiveness will destroy you. It will not destroy your enemy. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping that it will hurt the other person. It just doesn't work. So I want to fast forward now all the way to chapter 50 of Genesis. Now, Joseph has gone through so many things that we've talked about in the last few weeks. And now Joseph has been in power over Egypt. And now he has gone through seven years as one of the leaders. And that by the word of God that he has stored up grain and stored it and stored it up and stored it up because he knew that after seven years of great abundance in the land, there would be seven years of severe famine. And he heeded to the word of God, and he prepared it in that way. Now, the seven years of abundance have passed. Now they have entered into the drought and into the famine. Livestock are dying. Crops will not grow. There is no rain, and people start to starve. Everyone in the region of Egypt now has to come and stand before Joseph to be saved, to be spared. And now he sits on the throne, and people come, and they ask for grain. They are asking for survival, and he gives it freely to them. One day, his brothers walk in. They walk in into a room where he sits on a throne, and they do not recognize him. But Joseph recognizes his brothers after all of these years, and they come humbly before the throne. 
And these brothers, they bow and they drop to their knees and they place their heads on the ground before him. And as they bow before Joseph, the dream is fulfilled that he had when he was 17 years old. And there are so many things that happen in this story. And if you have not read the story of Joseph, I want to encourage you to go back and read it in its entirety because it is a heartwarming story of what takes place because on that day, he's reunited with his brothers. Then later on, he's reunited with his father. But his father is in old, old age. And soon after, he dies. And when Jacob dies, the brothers are terrified because now they know The only one in the family that was ever kind to Joseph was the father. Now the father is out of the picture. Now the father is no longer in control. And what will Joseph do to us? Because Joseph is in great power with a great amount of authority. He can do whatever he wants with us, and he may make us suffer in the same way that we caused him to suffer. And they trembled at that fact. In Genesis chapter 15, 50 and verse 15, it says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that we did to him? Terrified. In verse 16, so they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. Now, this is an absolute lie. Jacob did not leave a letter, did not leave instructions. But they make all of this up. In verse 17, this is what they write. They say, this is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And when their message came to Joseph, Joseph wept. When Joseph read the letter that his father had died, and yet the words that they wrote, it caused him to weep. Because Joseph knew that this was an absolute lie that they were writing. Now, I want you to think how they wrote this. They were very, very careful. They probably wrote and erased and wrote another word and erased. And and they wanted it just perfect for Joseph to read. And they start off by saying, Joseph, it's your father, your father, you know, the one that, that you love, that you respect. This is what he's asking for you to do. And then they, they come down and, and they're saying, and, and please forgive your brothers. And then he says, you know, you know, your brothers, the servants of the God, let's get God in there. You know, we are the servants of God too. And the God of your father, let's get father in there again. And they were very careful in how they they wrote all of this. Now, I want you to notice that these brothers, they never go to Joseph and ask for forgiveness. Never. They continue to lie. They continue to manipulate. They continue to deceive. But they never admit their wrong or ask for forgiveness. Have you ever noticed how that it's so much easier to forgive someone when they have wronged you and yet they come to you and they say, you know, I just want to say to you how sorry, I'm so sorry for what I've done. I don't know why that I said that about you. I don't know why that I treated you that way. But I just want you to know today, please forgive me. I'll never do it again. I'm just so sorry that I wronged you in that way. You see their heart breaking. And it's so much easier that at that moment when they've hurt you, that your, your heart just begins to melt, and, and, and you just want to embrace them, and all is forgiven because they're sorrowful for what they have done to you. But these brothers have never asked for forgiveness. They have never asked or never had admitted that they were wrong. And in verse 19, Joseph responds, and he says, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Question mark. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You accomplished what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. Joseph says before them, 
You meant to bring harm to me, but my God is in charge of my life. You meant to harm me, but my God has my future in His hands. You meant to destroy me and my future, but my future is not in your hands. My future is in the hands of the Almighty God. And it doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you do. My life is in the hands of the God in whom I serve and whom I respect. What you meant for harm, God twisted it, God turned it, and He made it all for good. That's how great God is. And it was on that day that He released them from their sinful deeds. And you know, that's a principle that you will find throughout the Bible. Let me just give you a couple. In the Old Testament, in Leviticus 19 and verse 18, It speaks very plainly to us, and it says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. He's very clear here that don't don't be revengeful. Don't don't try to, to avenge yourself. Don't hold a grudge because somebody hurt you. Isn't it interesting how we we still know what the Word of God says, but we, we still hold a grudge because you just don't understand how severe it was. I mean, you don't, you don't know because you've never walked in my shoes, but that's not what the Bible says. It says, do not hold a grudge. Go to the New Testament. In Romans, you'll find Romans 12, starting with verse 19. Do not revenge, take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, this is very, very clear that that so often when someone hurts us, we want to hurt them back. I mean, we want to pay them back for what they did. But God says, no, you're not the judge. I'll take care of those people. You don't you don't try to avenge yourself. Now, when we, when we want to get back at someone, and someone, well, they, they chew us out, so I'm going to chew them out. What we're saying is, God, I don't trust you. And God, I, I really don't want you in charge of my life. I'm God. I want to be the judge of this. And I want to do what I want to do. But as you continue to read in verse 20, it says, On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry... Feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That is just great advice. It's just good advice that, that he gives to us. You know, I want you to think back. All the way back to the beginning of the story where we started in in week number one. And you see in chapter 37 and verse 4, And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now, these brothers, they couldn't think of one kind thing to say to Joseph. There are probably people in our life that we cannot think of one kind kind word to say. But you go to the end of the story, and you find in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 21, so then, don't be afraid as he stands before his brothers. Don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them, and he spoke kindly to them. You see, what Joseph did that day was that he gives to them what they refused to give to him. You know, forgiveness, it releases us out of bondage. Forgiveness is what frees us. It no longer puts us under the control of those who have hurt us, wounded us. I want to move to the second word, number two, the word receive. Now, you have to release before you're able to receive. Now, I want to draw your attention to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. How many of you have ever recited the Lord's Prayer? Well, we all have. And I remember, you know, starting off young in in church and then also in Little League playing baseball. When I was a kid, before every game, 
you know, one team would line up on the first baseline, another team would line up on the third baseline, and their both teams are facing each other, and we would all recite the Lord's Prayer. How many times have we said the Lord's Prayer? But I want you to look with me in verse 12, and where it says, and forgive us our debts. Now, we're praying this, and what we're saying here is, God, please forgive me of all my sins, as we continue in the Lord's Prayer, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, do we really understand what we're praying? What we're saying here is that we're saying, God, forgive me of my sins in the same way that I forgive those who have sinned against me. Whoa. Now, wait a minute. I'm not sure I really want to pray that prayer. God, you forgive me at the level that I forgive those that hurt me. That's what we're praying. In verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In verse 14, for, now here's that word, for what he's doing is he's getting ready to explain why forgiveness is so important. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow, that is a hard saying. You see, you also find this in Mark chapter 11 and verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 34, Jesus is standing among a bunch of people and he's telling a parable, telling a story. He comes down to the end of the story and he says, and the master was angry and handed him over to the jailers until he paid back all that he owed. And then he ended the story. And then his comment after that, so will my Father who is in heaven also do to you if each one of you does not forgive his brother from your hearts. What will happen to you? Well, the Scripture says in the story that he told that you will be turned over to the jailer. Another translation said you will be turned over to the tormentor. And haven't we experienced that? That when you despise or you hate someone, when someone who has so wounded you and hurt you that you cannot let it go, you hang on to it and you harbor that and it turns to bitterness and, and you, you think and dwell on it and it's eating you alive. And the more you dwell, the more you hate and you're thinking about it when you go to bed and you're thinking about it when you get out of bed and during the nights that you will toss and turn and toss and turn because you are tormented by the power of hatred and unforgiveness. And what has happened is that you have been turned over to the tormentor. Now, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors, and yet we, we pray that and we still have unforgiveness towards someone. We're asking God to do for us what we're unwilling to do for others. And it's the height of hypocrisy. How can we ask God to do something for us if we're not willing to do it for others? Number three, the third word that I want to address is believe. If you believe, if you believe and you cannot forgive someone... If you cannot, as a believer, forgive someone in your life, it's probably because you do not believe that God has completely forgiven you. What I have found is that it's really difficult to give something if you don't have something. It's amazing to me how many people think of God as a God who holds all of our past over our heads and God keeps bringing it back to our attention, and that God will never bless us like He blesses somebody else because my past 
is so bad. I mean, I know the, the pain that I have inflicted into other people. I know the things that I have done that are so horrendous. And we believe that God holds it over us. And when something goes wrong, that I, I knew that God was angry at me. I knew that God was going to get me back because of what I've done. But I want you to understand who God really is. In Psalm 103, in verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That God, when you come to him and ask for forgiveness, God, forgive me of my past. What he does is he takes all of your past and he throws it as far in one direction as he can. And he says to never remember it again. In John chapter 3, when Jesus stood there talking to a religious man, and he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. It was Jesus who made that statement, born again. What Jesus was saying that is that the moment that you come to God, the moment you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, that at that very moment, all of your past is behind you, and God chooses to forget it, and he will never bring it back to your attention. And that's why it's to be born again, that at that moment, you're starting all over again. It's a fresh new start, and it's absolutely amazing. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, it says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, Jesus Christ, when he came, he took the sins of the world, he took your sins and my sins, and he put it upon Jesus Christ to bear our sins so we no longer have to bear our past. Jesus Christ now bears it all. And all the sins of our past are forgiven forever. And if you believe that, if you really believe that, then you will mimic that in how you treat other people. Now, we need to do what Joseph did, and what he did was he always returned good for evil. Now, I want you to watch this, and I want to, to go back to the beginning of the story, and then I want to shift to the end of the story on each of these statements. And this is what happened, that his brothers had driven him away in the beginning of the story. But at the end of the story, Joseph stands before his brothers and he calls them to come near. His brothers had left him without comfort or a home. But at the end of the story, he encourages his brothers and he comforts them and he provides them with a new home. His brothers had been willing to allow him to die of starvation and thirst in a pit. But at the end of the story, Joseph gave them provisions, food, and drink for their trip back home. His brothers sent him away on the back of a mangy camel. And yet at the end of the story, he sends them home riding on fine Egyptian carts. His brothers had ripped the coat of many colors off of his back. And yet at the end of the story, he gives his brothers expensive garments from Egypt. His brothers, in the beginning of the story, sold him for silver. But at the end of the story, Joseph gives his brothers bags of silver. And what you find is that Joseph demonstrated grace. And grace is the essence of forgiveness. And that Joseph was free from the sins of his brother because he didn't carry those sins. He didn't allow his brother's sins to become a part of his life. He separated it all. The only way that you're able not to take someone else's sin on you is to forgive them, release them, and let it go. Many years ago, the governor of Tennessee came to the commissioner and said, I would like to pardon five men from prison here in our state. And he said, what I would like for you to do is for the next six months, I would like for you to take the five men in your prison that have the best record for good behavior, 
And then those are the five that we're going to release. But don't tell the inmates what we're doing. We're just going to assess them for the next six months, and then we'll pick those five. Six months passed, and the governor of the state, the commissioner, and the chaplain of the prison came together. They called all the inmates out to the courtyard of that prison. And there were 1,100 inmates standing there. And the commissioner stands there with a microphone and says, Today, we are going to pardon five of you. Today, five of you will walk out of this prison as free men. And the chaplain who told this story said at that moment he had never experienced anything like this. He said it was like every inmate stopped breathing. There was not a sound. There was not a movement. He said it was so silent that it was like you could hear the heartbeat and the thud of, of each inmate's heart. No one was moving. And the commissioner came to the microphone, said, number one, Number one, Reuben Johnson. And everyone was looking around. Reuben Johnson stepped forward. Everyone's looking for Reuben. No one steps forward. The commissioner who read the name looked back behind him and said, Are all the inmates here? Yes, sir. Every inmate is here before you. Reuben Johnson stepped forward. The chaplain who was standing there knew Reuben Johnson. Reuben had been in some of the Bible studies with him there in the prison. And he sees him standing on the front row, but he's looking around like everyone else waiting for Reuben to step forward. And the chaplain leans out and says, Reuben, Reuben Johnson, that's you. He's calling your name. And Reuben looks and says, me, me. And, and he has a shocked look on his face because Reuben has been in prison for 19 years for a murder that he had committed, a sentence of life. There is no pardon for him, and yet they're calling him by name. And he steps out of the line. He reaches up, and he takes the piece of paper, and he looks at it, and he sees his name printed on that page, Reuben Johnson. And he clutches it to his chest, and he sobs, and he trembles, and he shakes because he cannot believe that what he has done, that he's a free man today. What I want to say to you this morning is so many times we just can't believe that God would really ever forgive me for what I've done. The people that I have hurt... The times that, that I've, I've cried out to God over and over and over and over, and yet I've abused it so many times, and God must, just must be sick of me. And I just co cannot even imagine. But I want to tell you in this room at this very moment, God is calling some of you by name. He's calling you by name, and you sense it, and you feel that this morning that He's calling you by name, and He's calling you home, and He's saying, today is your day of forgiveness. Today is your day of a new beginning. Today is your day to be born again, where all of your past has totally been forgotten, and where you stand today pardoned, free from your sin, free to walk in the freedom of Christ. I'd like to ask everyone to stand with me this morning. As you stand, I would like to ask you to just be steady in this ending prayer, if you'll just be steady with me. And if, as, you just, as you just bow your heads, I want everyone to close your eyes, center in. I want you to pray. I want you to look at your own life. And, and this, this morning, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But if you would like to receive Christ, and you want me to pray with you this morning, that you might receive Jesus Christ into your life, that everything changes on a supernatural level for you at this moment. With every head bowed and every person praying, I want to ask, if that's you, then I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and say, I want you to pray for me because I want Jesus Christ into my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. There are hands going up every place, every part of this building. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Many, many hands are going up. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You know what? I mean, many, many, many hands. This is your day. Because you sense the whispering of your name. 
It's time to come home. It's time for me to be God. And as we pray, you can't listen to me, but you got to pray it under your own breath. you got to pray it with your own lips. you got to ask Him by you. And if you'll ask Him to come in, He'll come in and start something fresh and new. But I want you to know, I want you to know that it all starts right here. That when you accept Him as God and Lord, that you're saying that I'm going to be obedient, I'm going to follow the Word of God, I'm going to make you God, and you better know that you're going to fall and fall and sin and sin and fall, but every time you do, God's not beating you over the head, but God is calling you by name to get up one more time. Come on, get up one more time, because your God is on your side. And he is bearing your sins and carrying you. So join with me and let's pray together. Father, Lord, right now I pray that God, every person who raised a hand, God, this multitude of people that have raised a hand this morning, that Lord, I'm praying that Lord, right now as we say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I want you to come into my life. God, I want you to be God. I want you to govern my life. I want you to lead me. Lord, I no longer want to be in charge of my life. But God, I want you to be in charge. And Lord, today, I'm willing to call you God. I'm willing today to follow the Word of God and to find obedience because what I want more than anything else is to find find my divine destiny in life. So God, I pray that this miracle of salvation, this miracle of of forgiveness, that God is, is just laying upon the hearts of every person. And Lord, that we receive that God, we know that something great is happening. Lord, we thank you for this miracle of salvation. And we love you and we thank you with all of our hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen, 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 amen.